Well, what a series we have in our hands here because what looked like a done deal where Bliss were going to then sweep it on through into the playoffs and get that clean 2 0, it has uh, completely kind of stuck here, Max. It feels very much the case that Fury, despite feeling nervous from that interview, have clearly come in with a game plan, how they want to try and approach things, and how they want to try and bridge the gap in experience between both rosters. Certainly looked like they were bridging that gap quite well last game. It was really neck and neck right up until that last team fight where things went haywire. For the side of Fury, but definitely a very strong game. You can see smiles there across the board, feeling happy with how that game went despite falling down 0-1. That's one of the better showings any team has had versus Bliss so far in this split, but you can already see the adaptation from this blue side draft. They acknowledge that the Karma was such a thorn in their side from Chirp. Going to pick it up for themselves with that first pick. Which does make things very interesting because we saw how much of a catalyst to their success was the Karma, obviously being a very strong focal point in that mid lane for them. But the bans for themselves, right, they're still going to deny away any kind of potential for a cheese or an upset with the likes of the uh, Aurelian Soul Change or the latest edition, be it the Smolder. As for Hooper, though, it seems like he wants to run things back again on this center. And if they go for the Nautilus again, it's like they've got themselves a fairly good shot at this one. We saw uh, Fido pick up the TP as well. Pretty omnipresent around the map to try and match things. But uh, individually on the champion, I felt like they offered them ever so much agency. Yeah, honestly, why not? I think it worked so well for them in game one. Hooper was also able to scale up quite nicely and be a very relevant DPS threat. While Findo, like you mentioned, was really the key engage member for Fury finding hook after hook. Now, the question is what the team Blitz respond with in this AD carry pool. The Callista has made it through draft and it will be this Callista Renata pairing. So, Senna Nautilus, a, a kind of pairing that wants to make it through, just kind of survive that laning phase, going to be answered with a very volatile 2v2 pairing from the side of Blues. It certainly is. It's a clear direction to say we want to absolutely crush this lane. And look, also, it's a Karma that will not be played in support. So, it has to mean one of two things either Harry or Biopanther are forced to pick up the reins, which would feel pretty crazy given the state of things. That's how much respect is being shown towards it. Chirp, however, though, isn't going to decide to try and play anything like a Seraphine mid, or uh, Lux or anything other. Otherwise, very you know, supportive in its nature. Is going to go back to basics. Is going to pick up the Syndra. It's funny if you're Fury, you're not really sure how to feel, right? Because on the one hand, yes, you've either denied Harry or Biopanther the opportunity to play a traditional carry. But on the other hand, it's Violet sitting there with two supports behind him. Going to be feeling so empowered on this Callista. Meanwhile, the other side, Chirp, has picked up this Syndra. So definitely a comfort pick for him. We even heard Harry early on in his interview talk about how good Chirp is when he gets onto the mages that he's comfortable on. So certainly will be a play to watch as we go into this game too. And I love the Jarvan ban. I think they're quietly smiling to themselves that the Jarvan wasn't picked third there by Fury because this Jarvan, once again, could have such a phenomenal start, right? You look at the Callista and say, you've got no range, you've got no escape, and you certainly could be a sitting duck. And we've seen Violet feel... Uh, that burden in the past when he has played this champion despite crushing it in the laning phase. Also, you mentioned the all-near for Bio. A good heads-up play from them as well as the Nocturne. Nocturne almost never going to be available here for Wino. Just provides too much value and really, it's the chaos that it creates. In a team fight. the last thing you need is extra people to worry about when you already have this Callista to deal with. So, jungle going to be quite heavily attacked coming out of this second phase of bans, but it does leave Fury the opportunity to strike first and pick up what they want here. There will be no Jarvan available. Jinzao also off the card, but that does leave the Vi. So when we're talking about single target lockdown, when we're talking about the ability to get on top of Violet and kill him, what better pick than Vi? So he is, and a clear decision by the camp of Bliss that this is the lesser of all three evils that they're quite happy for the Vi to be picked up because they can at least try to flash out play or bait them into a situation where the Vi is isolated. Uh, like we've already seen here tonight. Out comes the Udia then, and that is at this stage at least being hovered by a Kindred. We certainly have seen why not play that one. I'm curious what direction he would go, whether or not they feel like the uh, Karma is enough AP for them. You do wonder that as it is going to be the Kindred locked in here for why not. So a carry pick that he's looked very good on in the past, really able to push the tempo into a lot of these melee junglers and really take over the game if left unchecked. He can scale just as well as a center if he's able to get those marks coming through, but Tomasino will have the fifth pick here. Udi, obviously not a champion that is vulnerable to much in the top lane. And it looks like Tomasino will go towards one of the champions, I think, honestly, Skimmy, he's looked the best on this whole split, right? Finding solo kill after solo kill with this pick, being a menace in the team fights. 
and both teams have incredibly good scaling in this game. They certainly do, and I think you hit the nail on the head with that Gwen pick, right? He looked phenomenal in his 1v1 up against Tien when he took on Grand Zero, and I suppose to that point as well, maybe this is the culmination of back-to-back uh, -back weeks up against the big teams, right? They had to go up against Antic, followed by Grand Zero, now into Bliss. This is probably one of the hardest uh, strength for schedules to try and finish out your regular split to guarantee playoffs performance, because if you found the form now, you're really wishing you played those games earlier. Yeah, certainly a real test here for Fury, but they have drafted themselves quite a nice, easy to execute comp here, right? They have a lot of easy go buttons, a lot of ways to blow one target up, whether that be a scat of the week, whether that be a Nautilus hook, or of course the Vi, who's going to be coming over the top of that. And meanwhile, Team Bliss really have put their eggs in the Why Not and Violet basket. These two marksmen have a supporting cast of both mages and tanks to really empower them to go forwards. But the question, as always, when you see this Kindred, is how many marks? How early is she going to be able to come online and really start taking over the game? Because, you know, there's always that possibility that she's able to get online early. She's able to get those seven or eight marks nice and early and really start becoming a menace. And we know one on this Kindred. Certainly not a player to shy away from any chance to get those marks. So he isn't. It's um, a case for him to showcase that he managed to get up by, what, seven stacks at seven minutes beforehand. And uh, they have a really interesting interaction, right? They've got the ability to say, we have the bailout from Renata, we've got the Lamb's Respite from the Kindred. We have ways to immune your one-shot potential, your burst from the likes of a Syndra or the lockdown of a Vi. We can certainly delay and look to try and turn things around. So it's a spicy draft, one filtered with tons of aggression and a chance for Bliss to say, look, it's a dicey one, but the regular season is coming to a close. Let's get that 2-0. As for Fury, we're looking to try and double down on a success found from game one, build upon it with some different champions, and once again hope that Thomas Sudo can have a blinder. Definitely an exciting opportunity here for Thomas Sudo. The Gwen pick getting a lot of value here with that W, given that basically all of the damage from Team oh. Bliss is in that towards that top lane, but hooks onto Hayri. Not going to amount to much though, just a little bit of gold into Chirp's back pocket thanks to that first strike, but bot lane. It's already a flash out of Hooper. Yeah, look, that's the difference, isn't it? In experience, Harry says, look, I don't feel the need to burn the flash. I can just literally walk away from this situation. But Hooper is uh, already going to start off this landing phase fairly rough, as it looks like. Given that we are still playing blue side for Bliss, they're just going to camp that bush, wait for you to run back, and, uh, and look to try and deny you a fair bit. And what can you do, right? You can see Nox, as a result, having to path towards this bot lane level 1 because he knows that Bi Panther on this Udia is going to invade him if he does that red. So this Vi will be forced down towards this bot lane early on, which means that later in the clear, Violet and Scott will be feeling quite free to play as aggressive as they want. And you can already see without this flash on center, how do you actually walk up? How do you even contest and get an XP range? without falling down. Yeah, it's very rough now. Certainly uh, going to be leaning on the shoulder of Finder to try and get him through these first few moments, especially until that flash is back up and available. We certainly saw from the uh, fan vote, the overwhelming majority thing was like 97% of you believing that Bliss would win it out last time. And after that last game's performance, now it changes just a fraction, 90% instead. More Fury fans uh, jumping on the, uh, the hype train and hoping that they can really double down and at least bring this back to a draw. Cheeky bit of an invade here will be spotted from Fury's bot lane, though. You can see that brought Chirp over as well here. Huge punish. Absolutely beautiful punish here from the side of Fury. They say, look, we concede the bot lane prior. We've burnt our flash, but we're not going to allow you to steal our blue buff and get away with that too. That's huge there. Really game-saving stuff from the side of Fury. The bot lane collapsing nicely as well as the little priority that Chirp has in the mid lane, enabling him to get down towards that bot lane. And not only do you find the kill and deny those camps going over, but you also kind of save this dive. There's no Vi in the area to die, but that might not stop them. It's not done just yet, though. The Bellet will need to come on through. Is it going to be self cast on Scott? No, it doesn't get used as he looks to try and get the kill. They will find it. Oh, no. And unfortunately, it's Findo that picks up the double. This is the world's most fed Nautilus here. Three kills at three minutes, plus all the CS and XP he's going to get. But Biopanther's trading in the top lane, both ghosts. They're both going for it. They're looking for that all-in potential. And this time, the Udia is the winner. He takes down Tomasino. He's had enough of waiting till 25 minutes to get his revenge. He wants it now. He shuts down the Gwen. You can see the frustration on Tomasino's face. Not how he's used to seeing these lanes play out. 
but Biopanther is just a cut above. And here we go once again. You can see there's a massive wave they want to deny Hooper from getting. So the Ignite comes out immediately, which means that Scott takes so much damage and just dies to those three really juiced up turret shots. And then there's Fino, but Scott, right as we say that, falls down once again. He certainly does. That have one death into a second. You'd love to see what's happened there. And this is a really heads up play from the side of Fury. Let's look to really target this bot lane. If they want to try and be aggressive with a Callista Renata, let's not afford them the space to operate. And what a way to do it, right? Because not only are you kind of shutting down this early game powerhouse, but you're also buying time for your set of Nautilus who really do need those levels and those stacks to come online. Now this is a Nautilus with a Barmy Cinder. So even if a Callista is able to DPS him for quite a while, he has the survivability to live through that. Wow. Top side though, kind of the opposite story. You can see <laughs> Tomasino just so brutal in these trades here. As the stun will miss onto Hayri, but they're still looking for it. Four members of Fury in the area. Yes, yeah, enough to force the flash in the end. As we know, Fino had the flash, could have gone for that flash hook to make sure that the kill was found. But credit where it's due. It's uh, not going to be greeted out on this occasion. He certainly read the play, and uh, Fino can afford to do things like this because he can just TP back to lane. Yeah, and Hooper's still going to stay in this area, though. Bio Panther on the Udia has walked down to help. Why not secure this camp? You can see already this actually will be the mark here for Why Not. So a really big pick up here onto this camp nice and early. Five minutes in, though, there's already fights over Raptor camps. This game, neither team willing to go quietly. It does very much feel like we picked up the tempo from game one. Let's run it back to see how Scott falls victim here. It looks just like Nox is stuck in the area again. Yeah, he's here at an opportune time, right? You can see the waves crashing and perhaps looking to use the flash over that wall, but the hook is just pixel perfect. Make sure that there's no time for him to actually use that summoner. And it's just a simple chain CC. So this bot lane, which honestly, after losing that flash level one, I did have a bit of fear for how it was going to look for Hooper. They've absolutely salvaged it and they will head towards this first dragon. Yeah, they've really bounced back with such a strong statement. It's, it's phenomenal stuff, quite honestly. And much in part to Nox respecting that, look, why not? He's going to invade me, but I'm going to be in the right place at the right time and be there to punish. Yes, the worst case scenario was that all those kills were picked up by the Nautilus. But you'd rather that than nothing at all. And speak of, here they go for the three men dive in mid lane on the flashless Karma, which they forced out only a minute before. Yeah, but they're so far away and there's so much room for Hayri to actually run, especially with these tier two boots that he will feel very happy just leaving there. Now, keep in mind, Skimmy, Vi actually hasn't based yet. He is sitting on all this gold that he has accrued here, so Wano feels very comfortable getting aggressive like he's going to do now. So he does. Jumps across the wall without a care in the world. He's looking to literally run him down. An auto attack that travels all the way. No need to burn a flash, and Nox knows it. And now you can see he picks up all those items and wishes he'd done that only moments prior. And that Greed's going to be really punished here. You can see that Scott is linking with Why Not to head towards this Gromp as well. So not only does he fall down and give over that mark, but it's also a Gromp. And crucially, that's going to be his four marks picked up. Let's find a little bit of a trade here. It's going to be a very tanky Nautilus. What would have otherwise been a very simple kill for them to acquire. They're realizing very quickly, ah, he's a little bit too tanky. But to your point before, seven minutes in, and he's done it again, hasn't he? For Why Not, he's evolved with those four stacks. Absolutely has. Knock oh. looking towards this mid lane as well. Look at that. That's a flash pounce auto attack. This auto attack is deadly in the mid lane. And they're really making sure that for the blunders that started off in that early game, they really want to make a gold difference. They don't want to have any of this funny business of 100 gold being the, 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 the change at 35 minutes. And speak of, they get aggressive in bot lane two now. As they shove out Scott, drag him on back, stacking up the Ren stacks, beautifully baited by the wall. So Fido hits nothing. And they say, good night, sweet prince. They get the kill there. Unfortunately, it does go over to Scott on this Renata. Not who you'd be wanting to pick that up. But really nice use there of Violet with those Ren Spears. Just making sure that Fino feels like he can hook back in. Feels like he can turn that around a little bit. Especially since they're walking underneath the turret. But the bait will be enough. And suddenly, what was an overwhelming lead for Fury in that early game has shifted back and is now in the favor of Team Bliss. Especially this Kindred feeling very happy about the game stake. Yeah, very quickly laid stake or uh, reclaimed the stakes in this game to be one that is favorable for them. A lot of that in part to the great work that Bio's done to really make sure that this Gwen fifth pick doesn't find it's uh, just dessert. It's a case of making sure that Tomasino isn't able to be unleashed. 
especially now that he does have that TP, but for why not to answer back after dying to the enemy blue buff steal. You pick up two kills as easily as you like it to be, already stacked up and ready to fight even more. It's working wonders for them. You can see, why not's going to use this top lane priority to look for even more invades. He's got the marks, he's got the ability to do it. He will be fighting Nox though, and Hooper's here. Hooper is here, and that's actually who he's got the mark set out for right now, but he gets chained by that man, drops the ultimate, and says, Bio, can you help me? Because I don't think I'm going to survive. The heal comes out, the snip is there. And I'm sure Bio absolutely hates it, because now that Gwen is back in business. Yeah, Thomas even going to feel very happy picking up that kill after. Why not just simply... Gets a little bit over aggressive. Yes, he has the priority as, as a DC and a quick pause to follow. Maybe Tom Cena got a little bit too excited, mashed all his buttons on his keyboard and accidentally hit the Alt F4 there. <laughs> but nice to see why not finally punished here from Fury. They've done a very good job of tracking him throughout this early game, making sure that they're monitoring where his marks are, where he's likely to invade and sending members to match. You can see Hooper especially, not where I'd expect be expecting his center to be but has really been taking on the role of this support and playing it to a T. Certainly has been, and it's been an interesting case of uh, maybe that aggression, which is very characteristic of why not being read, understood, and predictably, to your point about the marks, being punished. Because second time now, he's gotten a little bit too over eager. And uh, yeah, quite honestly, Fear have been there to respond and um, very keen to capitalize on that one. So it's, it's a weird situation to find yourself in because you think, okay, he's in incredibly strong on his own, but... Uh, Fury are, are, are certainly not saying we're out of this game by any stretch. They're thinking, yeah, sure, it's not gone as clean as it went in game one, but we've got the Nautilus to catch these waves. We've got a center that can roam. We can act as not just a single jungler ganking, but there's like almost this three man death squad. That's what I love about Fury. Even last game, you could tell that there was certainly a lot of communication to bring the right members to where they needed to be around the map. And particularly for such a young team, it's quite refreshing to see their willingness to use the macro style of the game, especially against a team like Bliss, who, you know, we speak relentlessly about how much experience this team has, both domestically and internationally. So for a young team like Fury, with a lot of players who are in their, you know, first or second splits, to be able to keep up with them on that front speaks volumes for what this team is going to be able to accomplish. It certainly does, and it's a, a classic example that's happened time and time again where we've had rosters change between splits where you say, no, did you maybe just hit that peak or that form or find your river maybe too late into the season? Maybe a clashing of styles, personalities, the meta maybe not being favorable for you in that given moment, but I'm pleasantly surprised. I really am, and it's, it's, it's a great chance for teams like Bliss to not necessarily get humbled, that wouldn't be the right term, but to certainly not discount any of their, 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 their competition, which we certainly heard to be the case from Harry, right? We're not gonna take them lightly. We are gonna show them their, their um, you know, the, the, the correct amount of uh, patience and, and sort of performance, but just from the game itself, it has been very bread and butter stuff from Fury. We're not going to waste our time trying to do anything too convoluted. Let's just see a target, stun them, and take them down. And that's what they've done such a good job of so far, especially going back to the drafts, right? They really have made this game as easy for themselves as possible. And one thing I did want to talk about as well was I have been kind of bemoaning Hooper's struggles a little bit. You know, he hasn't been this 1v9 carry player that we know he can be. And I think of this adaptation to put him on this center, enable him to take a little bit more of a backseat in terms of playing the macro game, has looked really, really good for Fury because he has been a player who, you know, has been known to be vocal in games. He has been one to dictate the pace, especially when he has leads. And perhaps stepping into this more supportive role with the center has enabled him to do a little bit more of the shot calling because Fury are looking absolutely fantastic. Coming into out of that pause, you know, we did just see why not Take, getting taken down on the Krug invade. So already Fury, you can see, playing beyond their years. They certainly are. And uh, you do really wonder what's been happening behind the scenes, right, between the coaching staff, what Coach Rosie would have been offering to players like Cooper, who he's already spent a fair bit of time actually actively being a support for, right? Obviously knows how he functions, what he's looking to try and achieve. And I guess, uh, you know, adding to that uh, second degree of, of what makes you a good player, right? You can obviously understand the micro and the mechanics and be the flashy, 1v9 YouTube highlight player, but at the same time, understanding the macro certainly is what's going to elevate you to that international status. And um, obviously not to try and overhype them because it feels like we are certainly going that direction, but to, to contest the league's best is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a miracle, but definitely a really pleasant surprise when people can certainly look at us and say, it looks a little bit top heavy. Well, it absolutely is, right? I mean, this is a team that's lost one game, like a singular game 
all split and they came close to losing their second previously versus Fury. So the fact that we are seeing it be just this close, even if they're not actually winning the games, is a really strong sign to me because it also speaks to the fact that, you know, we do have some good rookie development. We do have these young players coming through who are able to contest people like Biopanther and Hagri and Violet, who've been the face of our leagues for so long. So definitely a refreshing thing to see as we wait to see what the issue is here with this pause. You can see both teams feeling pretty comfortable here. Biopanther always wants to remain cool under pressure. He's smiling, he's enjoying his time. And this is one of those people who you really want on your team in those close games, right? Even if he is playing something like an Udia, which doesn't have the biggest 1v9 potential, just having him there as that calm voice, as that leader in game, certainly an invaluable aspect that he brings to any team that he's on. Certainly is the stability, as you rightly mentioned. Uh, and these are players that are well versed with online games, be it on stage as well, obviously, which is a, a completely different kettle of fish and, and one that I'm sure a few would love to try and aspire towards, right? To get that under their belts as well. And, and go into split two feeling, you know, okay, we have a real shot now, sort of understanding, can we go any further? I guess like the real success story initially was Ion coming out the gates and surprising us all, but it feels like, yeah. you know, Fury are slowly kind of like stealing the reins. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping this isn't a one-off performance that if they do make it into playoffs, um, that they show us that there's a, there's a lot more left to be discovered for them to showcase and, and for them to keep us excited. Um, as far as the pools goes, uh, still a few minutes away. Looks like one of the players disconnected and uh, taking a little bit of time to get them back in business so you can continue to listen to our wonderful voices as we guide you through the night. Well, that was like a guided meditation there. It was. Do you Just like that? listen to our lovely voices as we guide you through the night. I'm losing mine <laughs> right now. This game's been so exciting. I can't imagine you especially casting that Nox Baron steal from last game, but certainly one of the more exciting games we had seen in that game one. And game two is shaping up to be of a similar vein. Now, it's quite a different style to, you know, what we're typically used to seeing out of Team Bliss here, right? Having Hayri not on this 1v9 champion will be a nice change of pace, I guess, for all of us to really see what Bliss is like when he's not available as that carry pillar. Because so often, you can kind of default back to just saying, oh, okay, well, you know, Hayri, he's the best man in the league. And you kind of subconsciously realize that he's just going to carry the game. But now, here, yeah, he's playing the Karma. So, yes, he's going to be able to do... A decent amount of damage but definitely not going to be able to 1v9 like he can on those other champions like his azir so it'll be interesting to see what he's able to get done and more importantly what the rest of bliss are going to get done we're back as we finally come back out of this pause we finally are the podcast is over the meditation is successful and you're back to watching some entertainment on your screen 10 minutes in five kills apiece 1k gold lead is where we're at right now for team bliss as fido starts things up with the hook knocks up two with the ultimate and forces out the bailout there as Violet tries to get uh, aggressive in response. A little bit optimistic there from Findo. I mean, the center W just missed, so you don't really have any lockdown after that initial combo comes through, which means Violet will be able to walk off Scott free here. But towards the top side, you can see Nox wanting to link up with Chirp here, but all the while, why not is hitting these Void Grubs. He's taking down the fourth one and is working his way towards the fifth. There is no ulti on the Kindred, but keep in mind all the priorities in favor of Fury. It's a weird spot right now for Nox. Do I go for the grubs? Do I go for the kill? The surefire thing seems to be take down this uh, Karma. The ult comes out. The Bela is there. Is the Lambs of Spite available? It is not. So Chirp gets his first kill of the game. And Harry is punished as the Karma. Big TP there from Fino as well to dissuade any further action. Why not? Does have the smite available though. And he's looking to pick up this would be the sixth Void Grub here. So Yuri not able to deny that fifth one going over. And with one kill the trade, you have to imagine that Violet is especially feeling quite nice towards his bot lane already up a decent amount of CS. And the TP will be used to come in and save this bot lane. But already this Callista, yes, he hasn't been able to get off to as many kills as he would have liked. But certainly the CS is going in his favor. Does very much feel like game one all over again. It's actually, there's a flash handshake from Scott. A very aggressive, firm handshake at that one. As Violet comes and through, says, there's my rent, there's my kill. I get plates, and then I get kills right after. And that's huge. Chirp TP down for that just to go down and fall himself. Which means that Team Bliss will have a window to get towards this dragon. There currently is only one being taken by the side of Fury. So they will deny this soul stacking, but Nox is here. Yeah, Nox is on. He says, I'll just go for this kill. Forget that dragon as the Lambs of Spike comes out just in the nick of time. And Violet 
really demonstrating their best defenses and even better offenses. He looks to try and survive. They do get that dragon. He flashes the safety, then blast cones back in. An absolute mad lad. Sidesteps out the snip snip there from Tomasino. And then Fino realizes that I'm absolutely stuck between a rock and a hard base. Into one stun, into a second, rooted in place. And Flash has been expended like you would not believe it. They both survive. Hooper, though, next one on the chopping block. He might share a similar fate as they both now. Diving between two towers. Unable to find it. Two men scattered of the week. So much so that now Nox is back. Another kill has found a shutdown going the way of Chirp. And at this point, we're so early on. Respawns are so quick. Just get out. Run away. They're looking. They're looking like they still want to go here. Keep in mind, there is a flash available for this Kindred, but the scatter of the week lands onto Harry. Can they outmaneuver this one in a 2v3 situation? Harry dies, but it's a 1-for-1 one one so far. Why not? What does he have left in this one? fun has got no mana. He's just got an auto attack, but he wants to greet it for Chirp. And they are right in that decision making. He's now got five. Oh my lord, this, that wasn't even a fight skimmy. That was a whole action movie. I was trying to think of how I'm going to break it down as we start from the very start. You can see Nox gets a little bit over eager here. I think he steps a bit too far forward, trying to find the pick onto Violent here. You can see, crucially, he manages to force out the Lamb's Respite, which buys enough time for this TP to come through and for Hooper to get into position. But this initial fight is all going in the favor of Team Bliss. Tomasino makes his way into the pit, but isn't able to find any real value. And like you said, Violet dashes back in to pick up the kill. It's really once Chirp arrives here on this Syndra that it starts to swing back in the favor of Fury. You can see initially just blows up Scott there and the flash to get distance. The chase continues on towards Hooper, but there's just a lot of CC, a lot of damage still remaining for Fury and Findo once again. It feels like every hook he throws connects. It certainly does, and they felt like it was such a surefire thing that they dive between two towers, not respecting that respawn timers are only like, what, 10 to 12 seconds? So instantly Nox returns, and by that point, it's an overwhelming numbers advantage. I'm sure Chirp is uh, incredibly happy about the outcome of that one. He had one kill initially, a few minutes go by, suddenly now has five. He's now got eight stacks on that Dark Seal. And if it continues at this rate, I'd actually give him a vote of confidence that he goes for the Magiars. Yeah, I'd love to see it, especially given how nervous he was in his interview. Certainly not playing like any of those nerves are affecting him right now as Fury. They will turn their attention towards this Rift Herald. They did a good job of cutting the mid wave, making sure they had that priority, which means that there will be no answer on this mid lane turret. And instead, you can see the three TPs that Fury are playing with really does enable them to move around the map with this Nautilus, make him almost a kind of surrogate solo laner as he's able to answer waves. This time it will be Thomasino heading towards this bot lane. Just a nice Rift Herald pick up there for Fury. This only is checking in with some of the stacks. You can see 33 so far for Hooper. Very much is playing the supported style. We've seen very many variations of the center, but it's quite keen just to uh, sit for the meantime. There's another hook goes out here from Fighter. The full combo actually being cycled onto Scott. He then goes gold in the end, getting chucked away by Violet. It's the hostile takeover being used during that animation. Really trying to make him is uh, incredibly protected as possible. Second cycle of that corner and goes on through. And is the like that, Violet's in trouble. He's got the bailout, but inside that land for spite, it still doesn't go off. I'm not sure about that interaction, but either way, Harry is fighting. He gets one back. Scott dies as Hooper picks up one, two. And Fury actually take the lead. Yeah, I have no idea what happened there. I would love to see a replay to break down that interaction, but Fury once again pushing the pace on the mid lane. It's Findo who starts it all off with these hooks. And just so much damage, so much burst coming through to be able to find this kill. I'm not sure if they'll be able to break the turret. Harry is here in response. And once again, you can see the power of this Syndra. You can see the power of the comp, the ease of execution that Fury have put together for themselves. As we take a look once again, you can see it's a really nice hostile takeover from Scott here to deny any further engage, right? If this doesn't land, the vibe just pops the ultimate and will take you down. You won't be able to respond. So it's a huge initial escape here. But this center E does so much damage, so much value rather, in terms of getting Finder to a position where he can cast that. Now, take a look once again. So it actually procs when he's right outside the, ba the Kindred uh. ultimate which means that the bailout still goes off. He still gets taken down. And crucially, with Violet gone, that's so much of your damage. One of your only two real damage threats gone. 
Means Fury having an easy time winning the fight now. Harry in a pretty precarious spot here. The Rift Herald's been summoned and they're looking to get the kill. So they are looking for the kill. Uh, so he's instantly forced to flash away. The route is fantastic and the team there backing him up from the flanking angles is enough to make sure that he's under no real threat. Well, that's a very dicey engage. And uh, Nox instantly forced to disengage from that one, realizing that I'm a little bit overcommitted. And uh, worse for wear. Meanwhile, though, why not? We checked in just before, and uh, we mentioned, what, 30 stacks for Hoopay. Well, he's already got seven. He managed to find four in seven minutes. There is the Magi is also being picked up by Chirp. He really does want to try and 1v9 this game. It's a hard one to try and break down from analysis, because you're not quite sure, Max, when they are going to fight. No, basically always is the answer when they're fighting. They are always looking for something, especially in the side of Fury, who have been incredibly willing to engage as he goes Fino again. Yeah, full combo from Fino on towards Why Not, making sure that he's forced to back away. He's got no flash. He would have been a sitting duck, but he doesn't need to do it on this occasion. The answer's back with aggro of his own. And now in a 5v4, they turn their sights straight down mid lane and say, we've got these Void Grubs. We've got the numbers. We will just siege. Yeah, this time Team Bliss are ready. They're able to respond to the Nautilus hook. And off the back of that skimmy, why not will be able to pick up another mark on that wolf camp there. So this Kindred has certainly been quietly achieving this game, you know, not really been making the biggest impact in these team fights besides those Lamb's respites, but certainly has been able to pick up a fair share of camp. So he will head back to base here. He's feeling very, very strong right now on this Kindred. That being said, it's almost eerily similar to game one in terms of how close the game is despite all the fighting that we've been seeing taking place. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. I mean, 2K doesn't feel like a sure thing at this point from uh, the side of Team Bliss. Yes, you're quite feeling good about this, Kindred, but he needs to be involved. Fantastic dash across the wall, and that is the involvement you're hunting for. The heel comes out, knocks dashes away. Both Scott and Wino are hot on his heels and saying you can run, and in this case, you will survive. The Trailblazer there almost able to make up the distance, but crucially, it won't come out. Now, the Scatter of the Week just misses there. Chirp's still looking, though. And he is still looking. Needs to preserve himself because 10 stacks of that Magius would be ashamed to instantly regret that buy. They're on the hunt, though. They're going to chuck Scott right in. Two men knock up. There's the handshake. There's the flash. And there's the runaway. Are they overcommitted? Because here comes by a fanfare. He's got the ghost. You can't oh. take him down. The blast code guarantees it. And Nox is now terrified. Nox is terrified. So is the rest of Fury, really. Once Biopanther rocks up, your one shot becomes so much harder, right? How do you actually kill this Udia without this center scaling any further into the game? Gwen right now, only the Rift Maker completed. Not able to really pose much of a damage threat. And once again, you can see how empowered this Kindred is, especially with the Renata sitting behind him, right? That Trailblazer providing so much movement speed as well as the W that's going to be able to come through as well. And as we check in with the total gold, no surprise to see Violet on top, but Chirp certainly holding his own amidst the sea of blue. He really is. Certainly is the, uh, the source of inspiration, a chance for a bit of hope that they can look to try and claw this one back. As we just crest over that all-important 20-minute mark, the Baron has now spawned. And it certainly does become a real consideration that if another pick like that happens, the Baron is on the cards. But certainly the likes of both Violet and Chirp have the world at their feet and a chance to really try and break open this game. But it does feel almost uh, a very difficult task for Fury unless they can try and catch off uh, Bliss because they have all these uh, ways to immune and, and sort of prevent that one shot. Yeah, there's certainly a fair few things to think about, right? Especially with that Renata W, that Callista ultimate. It's almost like the old Callista Thresh where you're really not able to kill either one of them because they can always peel for each other. And it really will be down to someone on Fury who has to walk in and has to find that initial engage. We saw last time what happened when Findo found that hook on mid lane because all the members of Bliss were in place. Even finding that hook doesn't secure yourself a team fight win. You can just fall down as a result of the huge DPS that's coming out. But here we go. Bypass with a little bit of a flank here. Nothing like and Bypass have found Findo. Yeah, they want to try and force this. It's a 5v4. Thomas is showing no signs of grouping up right now. Fury feel like they can get away from this one, but Bio wants to try and force their hands. Unable to find it. Fantastic discipline coming out from the Fury camp because it was all started there by Team Bliss attending to both top and bot waves, pushing, regrouping, now attending the Baron. They're attending the Baron and crucially Nox just used his smite there. He does have another one in about 10 seconds, but if they keep melting it, 
They might not have time. In man center route, the Baron has been disengaged away from, but Violet is still receiving the damage. Aggro is a hostile takeover. Nobody going to get hit by it. As a result, Golden Shadow is fantastic. And now, really, Thomas Hitter does stay amongst things. He goes immune from his own active, then jumps into the Kindred ult, who dies. He's still alive, and Thomas Hitter gets the limp away despite doing the most damage in this team fight. But Nox eventually pops. They couldn't deal with the better sustain and support that they have in the Arsenal. And Team Bliss are able to run away with things. I mean, just look how strong Udia is at this point. Bio, untouchable. He's untouchable. He's unkillable. And this Baron Never. will be in the sights of Team Bliss here. The start of the fight ending really well for Fury. We're able to find that initial pick because of that Kindred interaction with the bailout. But ultimately, it won't be enough. There's ultimately just too much DPS from the side of Bliss. And they don't have a smite, but they do have a Callista end and they will take this Baron. Well, they certainly will. The trade-off there for Fury. Second place prize will be Deny the Dragon. Two apiece now will be the answer. Running back on this team fight. This is an initial fantastic center route. Yeah, it looks really good here from Fury. You can see Thomas in his position in particular kind of forces why not to run into him with that Gwen W. And you can see, even with the Kindred pop, the second you go into that bailout, you will fall down regardless. So a nice quick kill is this second engage that is really the turning point for Team Bliss. They simply don't have the damage from the side of Fury and the range to get onto the backline members of Team Bliss. And like you said, this Udia is simply unkillable at this stage in the game. 4, 1 and 2. Koenig and Frozen Heart. Cheapest tank build ever, but also the most effective. And now, very menacing push here. The 4,000 gold lead from Team Bliss. Yeah, you certainly can't argue with a bargain from old Boris the shopkeeper. He's uh, dealt by a pretty handy hand. So I'll say, here you go, mate. Two item power spike. And the tanks keep on tanking. You can see now, grouped up with the rest of them, is a 1-4 split as they threaten both mid and bot. And you really want to make sure they find a fair degree of gold with this Baron play. Up by 1,500 so far. Only up by near 5. Overall, as they work their way towards a major oh. lead, but that skin of the week is enough to make anybody wince for a second. A full man stun and a redemption which instantly finds success. I would have loved to see if he had first strike there, how much gold he would have gotten. It looked like an absolutely huge stun to come through there. You can see already Chirp is providing so much value on this Sin Guns. Tomasino just getting ran down by Biopanther. He's a full tank, but he doesn't care. Look at Bio, he's just literally ignoring the tower. He does not care. Just a bit of a, a fawn in his backside there as he just realizes, I can just literally do as I please. Surrounded by four, I just do not care. There's the hook from Nautilus. It won't connect. Nox jumps in, and he's instantly forced to flash out. Yeah, I reckon we're never killing this video, guys. You can see Nox going in there, trying to find a little bit of a pick, and just realizes that, hey, even if my whole team is hitting this guy, he is not going to be able to go down. So Biopanther is becoming a real problem now because not only do you have all the damage that you need to worry about coming from Wynot and Violet, but also there's this incredibly tanky Udia who you somehow have to peel on top of everything. For the time being, it will be resets coming through from the side of Team Bliss. The, port, the push has paused temporarily and that will buy some time for Fury to catch their breath. Set up some vision and hopefully defend this remaining 20 seconds on this Baron. Right, you are. It's been a phenomenal base defense from them. They've not lost too much with their Baron being picked up by uh, uh, Team Bliss. Does end up settling on that 5k gold lead, as we imagined. But I don't think uh, Bliss is going to be too upset with that one overall. But certainly for Fury, they keep getting a little invitation here and there to try and retake the reins and just tease at the potential of a sniper away kill and, and that potential upset to make the series become a 1-1 one, one draw. But these late game situations are where things can get dicey. Emotions be heated. Maybe all that prep work can go out in the heat of battle. And where really that experience from your more veteran members becomes invaluable. As you can see Team Bliss working their way towards the last remaining out of turret here. They will take this down with no contest. And the question becomes, where do you draw the line if you're Fury? There's no Baron left, so you can just wave clear a little bit. But Violet finding so much damage on find over there. So aggressive as Violet, yeah, as you say, kites into the redemption to make sure that his HP bar is staying very topped up and healthy. The 4-1 split once again begins to take formation here. They target top end mid this time and really putting the pressure on to say that all these towers, your base, 
It's not going to survive for much longer. Violet activate the tank right now, dancing around this inhibitor. Scott gets chucked in the hostile takeover. Means that Fido has to hit his mid laner as Chirp on 20%. It's not long for this world, much longer here as Hooper from the base hits that Thorning Shadow. The shield is looking nice. The hoe! Oh, it's just not enough to heal! It can't do it! Why not falls on down? And inside the base, Team Bliss are getting wiped. Fido, he hooks Violet? a minion, but Violet is literally trying to 1v9 this game. He finds one reset. He's removed Chirp from the equation. Goodbye, the giant stacks. That's the support Hooper. Gets him in the end. It's a big base defense there from Fury, though. They don't lose the inhibitor, which is really the important thing there. And Tomasino especially finding a lot of value, being able to split the fights up and then find his target. You can see, once again, it starts off with an engage here from Violet, pulling in his support here, who goes forward. But ultimately, you can see the splitting here from Tomasino means that the carries can't really walk up here. There's just that threat of the Gwen. Too much damage to come out. That needlework so nice. Baits out the length of Spy nice and early. And you can see for the rest of the fight, Tomasino kiting around with that W. Not enabling these ranged carries to hit. And then a very nice scatter of the week off the back end. But we're right back into the action. The dragon has been started. All five members of both teams here, except for Violet, who's still coming from base. Yeah, Violet only having just respawn makes life a little bit difficult for him. The start of why not? As he cannot steal away the dragon. Actually confirmed by Chirp of all people. The scatter of the week, a bit of a two for one deal. That's huge though, Skimmy. It's 35 seconds on the death timer here. Only 20 seconds till Baron spawns. Tomasino is headed down towards his bot lane, but he does have the TP available. I wouldn't be surprised if Fury wants to continue pressing this lead. But it looks like for now, they're happy with the dragon. They're happy with putting themselves on soul points. And like you mentioned, this Syndra, 14 stacks on the Medjai, has still been able to keep those up quite nicely. There is definitely a one-shot threat coming out here. They're starting to scale. It's a 4,000 gold lead, but really, 17 to 17 kills, it all comes down to execution. It all comes down to execution. It all comes down to this last week of games. And I tell you what, Fury have really picked the perfect time to peek and try and show up. Because that's a TP. The Nisley Fury say, we don't want to take any part in this. As Udia rocks up to play. If that is any other champion, you can bet that they are turning on that instantly. But the fact that they know it's Bio Panther on that Udia, look at the damage ah. of Scott. <laughs> it's a jump scare for me. I feel the pain as Scott gets hit and really needs to run back to base because this Baron has been teased. This is one of the problems that Team Bliss might be running into as the game goes on. Yes, Kindred will be able to play it a bit further of a range because of her marks, but this Callista still confined to that relatively short range that she has. Means that she needs to play into the range of this Syndra. Means that she needs to risk taking all this damage. And yes, she has a wit's end, but you can see with Chirp almost ticking level 16. He has so much damage, so much threat. Five Panther looking at Fino though on the mid wave. It's a slow chase. It is a bit of a slow chase. There's two tanks. We say a tank, a support Nautilus. He's basically a tank because he is farming. Not able to juke it on out. Fantastic. Oh, again. Once again, free man stunned Violet. Nearly lights out in a heartbeat. I mean, look. We talk about Ryoma having the best stats of a mid laner, but Chirp is certainly not far behind him. He is doing God's work right now, really trying to one-shot and try and get them that all-important point here tonight. They're melting this Baron. Tomasino is on the bottom side of the map, though. Does have the TP. He will need to use it soon. He's not TPing. He's going to come in maybe a little bit too late. As the ult goes out, they set aside the lands for spikes. And the Baron continues to hit upon Nox. That's his eighth death of the game. Violet's found that reset as he hits over to level 16. The bailout won't be good. Harry not going to survive. He falls on down. And the Udia is finally taking damage. Everybody down to 50%. It's like a well orchestrated dance as they drive in and out, subbing members in, playing around cooldowns as Wider pounces on their heads and finally brings it to an end. The fight that we never thought was going to end finally does, and it does so in favor of Bliss there. You can see the way the fight split, Chirp finds a fantastic scatter of the week to start it all off with. As here we go, we take a look once again. Keep in mind, Tomasino is down towards the bot lane as this fight breaks out. Nox wanting to get aggressive here with Chirp and look at the scatter of the week in the back line. Three members, it forces out the Lamb's Respite, but all the while he's being taken down himself. This Udia and Karma combo just so sticky, able to get on top of you. And yes, Tomasino is strong, but this Udia, seemingly immortal, just does not go down. He certainly doesn't, and at this point, you're really unsure where to favor, but ultimately, Team Bliss are able to navigate themselves in a situation where they say, Willow, we all are. But we've got the cooldowns back. We can be the ones to respond first.
Well, it's a Baron. The second time it's gone the way of Bliss this game. And uh, they'll be hoping, no doubt, that this is the one that allows them to finally break open the base. They were good in their attempt last time, opening up a few towers towards those all-important inhibitors. But Scott. this time will be that nail in the coffin. You can see Scott there hunting for that initial pick with the flash handshake. Unable to find it, but forcing out a response. The Baron's so crucial as well, because a lot of Fury's wave clear does come from these AP users who really do struggle against this Nash. You can see in the bot lane, Biopanther able to shove in wave after wave in this mid lane turret. A few autos from falling on down, so... They are facing a potential double inhibitor situation here after Fury, but a scatter the weak land, Scott. Easily dragged out to safety as Nox jumps in. He's looking to try and buy on time. Scott is dead now, but the fight continues in his favor. The hostile takeover means that Chirp is dead. He had no flash. He had no chance to survive. And then Bio, it really is his chance to showcase that you'll never take me down in this game. They get the ace. It's not quite the perfect one, but they don't care how they get it done. All they want is that perfect 2-0. They preserve the perfect finish to what's been a phenomenal start. But boy, did they have to work for it. Fury have given them a real strong test leading into playoffs. It's deja vu from game one. Back and forth, back and forth. Fights going each way as we get treated to another why not dance. But ultimately, Bliss, they stay strong. They stay resolute and they take the clean 2-0. They certainly do. Lots to take away from this one from Bliss. Maybe not their dance. Maybe that's one we can leave for the bot afterwards. But I'm sure they've got a lot to discuss, not only between themselves, but between the coaching staff as well. We'll break down the entire series right after this break.